In summing up the Western intellectual tradition, I'm pre presented with a very daunting task because it's almost impossible to do justice to all the tens, trends and tendencies in the cultural life of the West over the past 3,000 years or so. But a lecture series like this deserves some sort of recognition that it, there is a certain cultural unity to the West. And insofar as it's possible, I'd like to touch on some of the themes, some of the topics, some of the questions which have been treated throughout the history of Western intellectual life and to try and categorize and connect at least some of the main issues that have been discussed throughout the past six days of lecturing. Uh, I appreciate the fact that you've borne with us through 55 odd lectures. It's a testimony to your philosophical capacities. Let's start back with the two great traditions that make Western intellectual life what it is. The traditions that come from Athens and Jerusalem. The traditions of Greek rationality and biblical interpretation and see what the mythos and the logos of Western intellectual life amount to. The mythos of the West is scripture. It comes out of Jerusalem. The mythos that is embodied in the Bible is the canonical narrative of Western religion. And for religious believers, God's revealed word, God's authoritative statements as they're represented in scripture are reality. And there are many passages in scripture which allow us to think this problem through in a symbolic way, which is no less sophisticated than the rationality that comes out of Greece. Stop and think about the book of Genesis, where God says, let there be light, and light was made. What that means, or the way that can be symbolically read, is that God's word is reality. And not only when God speaks it, do things come into being, but the one unassailable source of religious knowledge and theological illumination is the authoritative word of God. For religious believers, God's word is reality. And this is encapsulated in the myth of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, the beginning of the world is given for Christian believers, the last book of the Christian Bible, the book of Revelation, contains the end of the world. For the religious believer, everything from the beginning of the world to its end is contained within scripture. And the great achievement of this scriptural tradition, this body of theological knowledge, is the idea of monotheism. The idea that there's one God rather than a plurality of nature spirits, or a pantheon of gods as we found, as we'll find in Greece. The great achievement of the Hebrew Bible is the idea that there is only one God and that he has a providential control over history. And this is the central achievement of the, or the central achievement of the Hebrew Bible. And it's interesting to note that after achieving this great breakthrough, after bringing all the mythological accounts of the world under one general rubric, one giant, enormous power that has a personality, has intentions, and communicates to human beings. It's then the, the decision on the part of the Christian epoch and the Christian scriptures that God is going to be broken down into pieces once again. And you have to pause to consider this. If monotheism is the great achievement that almost all scholars believe it to be, what is the point of breaking God up again after it took us two or three or four thousand years to turn the various spirits and gods and myths into one big architectonic myth? If it took that long to achieve the goal of monotheism or the end of monotheism, what is the point of reinventing or reinterpreting this God as a trinity, as is done under the Christian during the Christian centuries. And I want to take a stab at the interpretation of that because it's worthwhile in that it tells us something about the kind of things that are most valuable to us. I would be inclined to say that theology is a kind of poetic discourse 
which allows us to speak about things of ultimate concern to us. And if it has become unfashionable, it has in some respect left us unable to talk about questions of ultimate concern. And it may be in that respect that we are the losers. So let's look at the Trinity, at the three natures of the Christian God, and see what sort of mythological interpretation, what kind of symbolic interpretation we can give to that. Now it's very clear that God the Father is God the giant authority figure. He's the God who creates and demands moral order. He's the kind of God who sends the Ten Commandments. He's the kind of God that tells people what thou shalt and shalt not do. He's the God that we met in the book of Job, when God speaks to Job out of the whirlwind and says, Where wert thou when I created the world? Speak if thou hast understanding. That's God, the authoritative lawgiver. That's the God that Freud understands, the mythological father figure raised to an impossibly elevated extent. But the difficulty here is that this is not entirely satisfactory in a psychological sense. God as a lawgiver is a necessary part of any theological conception or of the West theological conceptions, but in many respects it's psychologically unpleasant, unattractive, and somewhat lacking. Not that we could ever dispense with God's function or God's, God's qualities as a moral lawgiver, but in fact, he seems a rather distant and a rather forbidding and a rather unkind God, a God to whom we are, as Jonathan Edwards says, sinners held over a fiery furnace, threatened with damnation by a God that is distant from us, that is enigmatic, that is difficult to interpret, and is very hard to sympathize with, except, and it is very hard to placate. The implacable God of ultimate righteousness is God the Father. This is the God that Job talked to, and it's an indispensable element in God. But there are two other elements which are worth consideration and which offer us not a different God, but different faces of the same God, of the same universal moral force. Jesus, as an incarnation of God, is God that has human characteristics. He's the suffering God, the God that knows what it's like to be us. Jesus is the God that has the most human and humane of characteristics. It is not that there's anything less moral about the Jesus stories than there are about the God the Father stories, but rather that it is much easier to sympathize with the suffering Christ than it is with the omnipotent moral lawgiver. He is more accessible to those that suffer, and since human suffering is to a great extent the human condition, it is in some respects a humanization and a universalization and a connection between the ultimate moral order of God's awesome majesty and the everyday agony and the extraordinary misery that's sometime visited on human life. Jesus is the God of mercy, the God of suffering, and here I'm not trying to convert you to Christianity, but rather to help you to interpret and appreciate one of the central sets of myths in the West. When I talk about the Greek pantheon, I will not be trying to get you to worship Zeus, but rather to appreciate what these images mean and to take what wisdom you can from them. Perhaps what we get from scripture is not so much knowledge as wisdom, and I doubt very much that we would want to dispense with wisdom in, purely, in a pure search for rational knowledge you to interpret and appreciate one of the central sets of myths in the West. When I talk about the Greek pantheon, I will not be trying to get you to worship Zeus, but rather to appreciate what these images mean and to take what wisdom you can from them. Perhaps what we get from scripture is not so much knowledge as wisdom, and I doubt very much that we would want to dispense with wisdom in, purely, in a pure search for rational knowledge. The point is that rationality isn't everything, and perhaps God's awesome morality is not everything. Perhaps we would like access to the divine in a human form. And perhaps it gives us a meaning to our suffering because there is no human life that lacks some sort of anguish so at some point in time. Suffering is in some sense a necessary part of the human condition. What is it that Dostoevsky said? That suffering is the origin of all consciousness? Well, Jesus is the suffering God, 
And what makes him profoundly different from us is, of course, that he is God and man at the same time. But to take it beyond that, when we suffer, when we cause others to suffer, there's in some respects a justice to it because in fact we can view this suffering as somehow being caused by our own depravity or by the depravity of our humankind, of our human species. In other words, if we're going to cause misery for other people, it should not surprise us that it comes back to haunt us. What comes around goes around. What's remarkable about the Jesus story is that he's the only example of someone that suffers and suffers grotesquely because the story of the crucifixion is one of the most horrifying myths, not just in the West, but across the board. The suffering of Christ is entirely undeserved because one assumes that he's the example of the morally perfect human being. Even those that are outside the Christian tradition or atheists or of some other faith usually recognize that this is a man that's praiseworthy, if not divine, and that whatever suffering he incurred, he didn't do anything to deserve it. The difference between Jesus and us is that we suffer because we have it coming to us. Jesus suffers for no reason that we can see, he can take upon, uh, our, take upon himself our suffering, give it meaning, make it bearable. Jesus is the God of suffering humanity. And the significance of Christ's crucifixion and death, I think, is something like this. In the Hebrew Bible, sacrifice is very important. Remember when I gave a lecture on Kierkegaard and we talked about Abraham and Isaac? That case of the human sacrifice did not actually go through. Instead, if you read things like the book of Leviticus, sacrifices are regularly scheduled and regularly programmed, and as a gesture of respect towards God, you can't just sacrifice anything to him. In fact, you have to sacrifice a sheep or a ram or a goat, and not just any sheep or goat, but the perfect sheep, the one that is spotless, the one that has no blemishes. The movement from the sacrifice of animals without physical blemish to the sacrifice of the man without moral blemish is an upping of the ante. Instead of a recurrent set of sacrifice, sacrificial animals, we are going to have a one-time only deal. We will sacrifice the one example of the morally perfect man, and that may be a way of interpreting the idea of Christ as God's son not son in the literal sense, but son in the sense that he's the one that comes closest to approximating perfect human virtue. If we take that reading, then what happens when Christ is sacrificed for our sins is that he takes the place of all the animal sacrifices and history turns a corner. This conception of the world, this conception of religion, this conception of the good life leads us to a conception of God's providence, leads us to a conception of human history as meaning something. All of our unhappiness, all of our evil, all the injustice we both see and feel ultimately means something. And if it is possible to get to the marrow of myth and find some meaning to the everyday lives and the everyday pain that we encounter, then myth will have done its job, regardless of how you want to organize it and what sort of epistemological qualities you want to attribute to it. This is the, the, the import, I think, of the second of God's incarnations, God as Christ. Perhaps the most interesting of the incarnations of the Trinity is God the Holy Spirit, God the Logos. This is the God of the philosophers. It doesn't have a body. It seems somehow to be universal. If you will remember from the Acts of the Apostles, where the Holy Spirit comes down on the disciples of Christ after his death at Pentecost and gives him the gift of tongues, the ability to transmit information across languages, across time, across culture, is, in some respect, what makes the human project and human history and all of the human species into one large unity. The God of the philosophers is the Holy Ghost. It should come as no surprise later on that the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit will be a big theme in German idealism. The Geist of Hegel is in fact the Holy Ghost. Philosophers would prefer to leave out the most overtly mythological elements because usually the literalness of religious myth 
is somewhat unattractive for them. It's not always the case. You can look at counterexamples like Aquinas. But throughout most of the Western intellectual tradition, God, the Holy Spirit, has been the God of the philosophers. It's the most abstract, the most universal, and it's this ineffable something that connects all of human souls and all of human aspiration. So the point of splitting God up into three parts after the tremendous labors involved in unifying God under one rubric, under the idea of a single God controlling all of destiny and all of human experience, is to create accessible faces for a God that is, in fact, inscrutable. As God says to Job in the whirlwind, speak if thou hast understanding. Where wert thou when I created the world? Since different people under different circumstances for different purposes need different access to the divinity, the idea of a trinity is a way of making God's awesome mystery accessible to people uh, and under circumstances in which it would not be accessible. This is the fundamental substratum. This is the mythological foundation of Western culture. Now, when I say that it's the mythological foundation, I do not mean that in a pejorative sense. Myth and is a kind of narrative which is the earliest and, in some respects, the most primitive kind of explanation, but we will probably never outgrow it. And the proof of that is the fact that we haven't run out of literature. In fact, all literary attempts are ways of creating myths which imaginatively engage the human psyche and tell us some things that logic or science perhaps is unable to articulate. If it suffers from the defect that it is less clear than formal logic, if it suffers from the limitation that it is less obvious than physical science, it also has the advantage that it extends the range of our discourse at the cost of loosening up our diction. If we don't speak as precisely, we can extend the reach of the things we can talk about. Perhaps this is the right answer, the right response to Ludwig Wittgenstein's idea that what we, must, what we cannot speak about, we must pass over in silence. Perhaps what we cannot speak about in a purely logical way, we must pass over into poetry. And theology is the highest and most important kind of poetry. No human life should be without it in some respect. This, I think, is the most important element that we get from the tradition of Jerusalem. It does other things. It legitimizes benevolent dispositions and sentiments on the part of human beings. It gives them a meaning to life. It allows them a certain certainty, which, if not entirely demonstrable, has its good effects, has its pragmatic justifications. And I think this is what Jerusalem has offered to Western culture, and I think we will, in the long run, never be able to dispense with it. We will run out of the need for this when science w is everything to us, and I suspect that that will never happen. Now let's look at the other alternative foundation, or the, the kind of coexistent foundation of Western culture, and that's the tradition that comes out of Athens. And this, I would say, is the home of the logos. By logos, I mean, in the Greek sense, speech, reason, rational argument, human rational discourse. It's not that Greek culture failed to produce myths. In fact, the myths of Homer or the myths of Plato are extremely powerful and extremely important. There is a great deal to learn from these myths. Whatever your religious beliefs, do not restrict yourself to the encounter with one set of myths. The set of the world's myths contains, in a great extent, the set of the world's wisdom as opposed to the set of the world's knowledge, and do not pass over wisdom in the process of getting knowledge. What is it that Ecclesiastes says, buy wisdom and sell it not? Well, perhaps there's wisdom to be bought in a great number of myths, and it seems to me that however great the Greek myths are, and there's plenty of wisdom there, the great contribution which Greek culture makes to the culture of the West is the idea of unfettered, free, humanistic rationality. It is essentially a human and humane set of ideas. Now, what's important about the tradition that comes out of Athens is that it creates the first secular knowledge. And this is not just a breakthrough in the history of the West. This is a breakthrough in the entire history of the world. All through the history of the world, taken in a global perspective, there is no divorce from 
between knowledge and religion. There is no secular knowledge prior to the first inklings of secular knowledge that comes in just before the age of Socrates. The beginnings of secular knowledge lie, as Karl Popper said, in the criticism of myths. And the beginnings of secular knowledge can be found in two sources. The first source inquires into what's called the physis, P-H-Y-S-I-S, from which we get the word physics. And the first source of our secular knowledge is in the pre-Socratic physicists. They criticize the myths, particularly the myths regarding natural science and the, way the, and the, the physical world around them, and tried to create secular, non-mythological accounts of physical nature that would go beyond myths and would not just be another set of plausible stories. When the pre-Socratic physicists say that all is water or all is air, when they say that the sun is not the sun god Apollo, but a hot rock, what they are doing for the first time is bringing physical knowledge down to us, making it accessible to every individual rational mind, independent of initiation into a certain religious tradition, independent of direct illumination, independent of any antinomian connection to the Godhead itself. This is one of the great achievements of the human psyche. It is what made Greek culture the foundation of rational inquiry in the West, and it is what separated science, or what separated knowledge and religion, which is the characteristic quality of the West. What happens in the West and what makes it a particularly unusual cultural configuration is that this is the source of the world's secular knowledge. Prior to the pre-Socratics and to the Greek sophists, set all knowledge is bound up with religion. Now, the second group of Greeks that criticized mythological knowledge and inquired into things in a purely human, rational way were the sophists. And these are the famous opponents of Socrates. The sophists are people like Callicles and Gorgias and Isocrates and, uh, oh, uh, who else? Two or three others. Uh, Gorgias, Callicles, Thrasymachus. Thrasymachus will be the best one for our purposes because he plays such an important role in the Republic. What the pre-Socratics do, in particular the pre-Socratic sophists, the ones who want to inquire into the human world in a purely n rational, non-mythological way, is instead of inquiring into phusis, inquiring into nature, they're going to inquire into nomos. And nomos in Greek is translated as political law, as opposed to natural law. They are going to look into the laws that govern each of the city-states in Greece and the laws that govern each of the other countries that they're familiar with. And what they are going to do is say that the mythological foundations of these political orders, the mythological foundations of these social systems, have no more validity than the mythological accounts of nature. The caustic skepticism very quickly turns into a sort of Machiavellian nihilism, a sort of Nietzschean will to power philosophy. And if you stop and think about what the sophists represent in Greek culture, what they represent is the sophisticate, the one who no longer accepts the ancient myths, who no longer believes that Athens is Athena's city, and instead thinks that the laws of Athens are a series of conventions arbitrarily made up, that the gods do not sanction these laws because the gods appear not to exist. And what this leads to is a straightforward skepticism with regard to legality. What it leads to is an attempt to create individual power for a person who has liberated himself from the force of myth. Now, the advantages of this perspective are quite clear. It offers us a secular, human interpretation of political order and political justice. The difficulties with it are not apparent until, apparently, Socrates begins his inquiries and finds out that at the bottom of this, what we have is a very refined selfishness and cruelty. What we have is pure power politics, unadulterated by any considerations of conscience or morals, because the sophists work on the assumption that since all justifications of moral theory, all justifications of political order, the foundations of nomos being ultimately mythological, when we sweep away myth, we also sweep away morality.
And what that means is that we are left essentially in a state of nature. We turn out to be predatory animals who use speech, who use war, who use any means available to satisfy our desires. If you can think about someone like Gorgias in the Platonic Dialogue, the Gorgias, where he says that the happy man is the man that has profound desires and tremendously, uh, tremendously powerful passions and who manages to satisfy these desires to the greatest extent possible as many times as possible, you have a view of human beings as essentially machines or as essentially automatons whose existence is good or evil, blessed or wretched, on the basis or on the foundation or as a result of their ability to satisfy their desires. What the sophists do on an intellectual level is move the ideal of the Homeric hero of the man who is mightier than others and who can satisfy his own desires, the individual who is superior in his personal qualities, what they do is take the idea of the Homeric hero and turn it from a, from a heroism of the body to a heroism of the soul, a willingness to question all morals, a willingness to question all sources of political legitimacy. The sophists are heroes of the soul if they are lacking in moral justification or in moral distinction, one cannot dispute their heroism. Socrates is the next step in this development. Socrates is as much a myth, frankly, as Jesus. Who knows what he was in real life? What we know about Socrates from the Platonic Dialogues is a beautiful, profound, and eminently witty hero of the soul who not only has mental powers but he has in addition to that a sort of conscience which is both intellectual and ruthless in its penetration. Socrates represents the will to knowledge at least as we get to know him in the platonic dialogues. If on the other hand you were to read Xenophon and his treatment of Socrates you get something like I don't know, the Greek analog of Ben Franklin, a kind of wise old man, but not nearly so heroic, not nearly so profound as the image we come away with in Plato. So whatever Socrates is in historical fact is not really the issue for us. The issue is what Socrates represents as a symbol. Socrates, in symbolic terms, is Greece. Socrates represents the will to rational knowledge. Socrates represents divine insubordination, the Promethean demand that we bring knowledge down from the heavens into the agora, into the marketplace, into the world of human beings. And if we can't get complete access to ultimate knowledge, to the form of the good or the form of the true, we can at least strive for it, and the striving ennobles us, and nobility, whether of the soul or of the body, is one of the chief Greek virtues and we cannot dispense with Socrates' moral nobility, his intellectual nobility, when we encounter him in the Platonic Dialogues. Socrates is the hero of knowledge. He supplants the Greek hero of warfare. He is the man who is heroic because he does only good to other people, never harm. He stands the ideals of the Homeric hero on its, on its head. And for that, we are eternally grateful to Plato because he has offered us an icon, a perfect image of what we potentially could be if we were to lose our complacency and our smugness and our self-indulgent. Socrates is a kind of beacon that asks us always to accept our knowledge as provisional, never to allow our certainties to ossify into an inability to question ourselves. And if we look back on the history of philosophy, every great philosopher in the Western tradition has had that capacity to interrogate himself and an unwillingness to accept halfway partial answers. Socrates is the eternal gadfly. And the reason why you ought to make his acquaintance when you finish reading or listening to this set of lectures is because it is good for your soul. Socrates demands that we confront our soul. And if we concede to his demands, we can only be made better, never worse. As Socrates says in the Republic, the good man does no one any harm, and he's been doing people good for 2,500 years. Now.
The Western intellectual tradition amounts to an uneasy braid of the intellectual traditions that come out of Athens and Jerusalem. And I say uneasy because there are parts of Athens and Jerusalem and the view of human life and the view of human existence that they have that go together well, but there are parts that do not go together well. And there is a persistent unreconciled tension between these two. And I strongly suspect that this tension is not reconcilable, that it asks us to do contradictory things sometimes. Let's try an example. And the example I want to go for is to compare the tablets of good or the conceptions of virtue characteristic of Platonism and Christianity on account of the fact that they offer us different perspectives on the human condition. Platonism says that a good man is wise, courageous, moderate, and just. He's got the, four, the three parts of his soul, the gold, silver, and bronze. Each of the parts of the soul is in harmony. The city is like the man, so when each of the parts of the city get into harmony, we have an isomorphism between the city and the man. And these virtues taken together, wisdom, courage, moderation, and justice, are in fact what it means to be virtuous. That is the true spiritual arete of Greece. Let's connect that to the Christian virtues, faith, hope, and charity. A different tablet of virtues, but they are in some respects connected, and they are not necessarily exclusive, with one possible exception. Let us think about the problem of hope and its mythological formulations. For Christians, hope is a virtue. And if you want to buy into this conception of the world, you must accept that there are things to hope for, and hope is not foolish or evil. It is one of the things that makes us what we could be, that allows us to fulfill our potentials. But in Greek mythology, that's not the case. Those of you who are familiar with Pandora and her box, well, she's the one who gives all evil to the world. And when she opens the box that the gods have told her not to open, all evils fly out. She closes it up and hears that there's one more thing inside the box and decides, well, while I'm bringing all of evil to the world, might as well open the box. And what's the last thing that comes out? Hope. In other words, it appears that for the Greeks, hope is a vice. This is a very difficult and profoundly unsettling conception. What possible standard could we bring to bear on this question? Are we not forced here to a Kierkegaardian criterionless choice? What could prove for either side of the argument whether hope is a virtue or a vice? very hard to say. Surely in the biblical tradition hope is a virtue, hope in God's providence, hope in God's justice, hope in God's moral order are enjoined upon us by scripture. In the Greek tradition hope is the step just before disaster. Those of you who are familiar with Thucydides Peloponnesian Wars, who are familiar with that awful, that, that horrifying dialogue between the Athenians and the residents of Milos, know that in pure power politics you must accept the simple brute facts of coercion and if you do not you are placing yourself in grave peril the Melians when threatened by the much more powerful Athenians say that we have justice on our side and we will not give in we think freedom and virtue will win out in the end we are going to we hope for help we hope for, resolu for divine intervention. We hope for something that will clear us up and will allow truth, justice, and virtue to win out. And after they do their hoping, the Athenians come in and kill everyone. All the men who are alive get killed. The women and children are sold into slavery. The city is destroyed. The Melians are dead. There is a moral there about what hope is. Hope is a vice in the Greek tradition. A very dangerous and unsettling question. Now. Once we get to these impasses, we have to make decisions. I don't know how to guide you through that. If any of you figure out how, let me know. But in the interim, until you do, at least expose yourself to the possibility. Ask those Nietzschean questions. I ask you to have not just the courage of your convictions, but the courage to question your convictions, which is far rarer. If you are willing to take that chance, the potential benefits are as great as those as any offered to any human being. Now, 
let's get beyond the simple dichotomy between Athens and Jerusalem. Let's begin to think about the human psyche itself. There is in every human being a rational and, and an emotive part. None of us are entirely creatures of sentiment. None of us are entirely creatures of rationality. And the dialectic between these two is not only instantiated in the individual human being, we also see a dialectic between reason and emotion in the entire Western intellectual tradition. This dialectic is probably a consequence of the fact that it's built into either of us or all of us, and the fact that it's built into us means that different sorts of functions are going to be served by, a, by different degrees of emphasis on reason and emotion. The Greek tradition is the tradition of reason. It is the source of the logos in Western culture. The tradition of biblical religion is profoundly emotional. This is not to say that, they are exclusive, that it is exclusively emotional. If you look at the tradition of Talmudic interpretation, if you look at something like Calvin's Institutes, if you look at, say, the Jesuit tradition in Catholicism, you will found, find profound rational activities organized around scriptural exegesis. On the other hand, if you were to look at the history of science or the history of mathematics, you would find strong emotional undercurrents in the people actually engaged in these two, in these disciplines. Look at the, uh, the, the competition between Newton and Leibniz and the amount of personality and the amount of ego and the amount of motion that's involved in the development of science and math. It is not entirely a rational activity, although the results of it, if it is true mathematics, must necessarily be rational. There can be no doubt about that. If we look at the entire history of the West, I think it's pretty clear that the age of classical culture, starting in Greece, roughly 600 BC, and continuing on through Roman times, ending, let's say, roughly speaking, 400 or 450 AD, represents about a thousand years in which reason, the logos, the Greek tradition is emphasized. After the collapse of Rome, we find a movement towards dogmatic Christianity as the foundation of Western culture, and this is due to the fact that Christianity is, what is the only or one of the few important cultural institutions that survives the barbarian invasions relatively intact. Cities are comparatively easy to destroy compared to trying to destroy a religion. Religions are notoriously hard to undermine through warfare, and Christianity, because it continues on past the fall of Rome, is in fact an age, roughly speaking, of a thousand years between, say, 400 and 1400, up to the, the, the beginnings of the Renaissance, which are profoundly emotional in their orientation. The mythos is dominant over the Logos. At the end of the Middle Ages, roughly 1350, 1400, for a great number of reasons, the Black Death, the end of the Crusades, access to Arabic learning, a, a wide variety of reasons, there is an unanticipated resurgence of Greek humanism, and it's called the Renaissance. And it's the Renaissance, or rebirth, of classical learning, of, humanistic, of a humanistic orientation towards the Logos, and it is a revival of cultural orientation towards reason. It is not that there is any lack of emotion in the Renaissance. If you look at any of the great works of Renaissance art, there can be no doubt whatever that profound sentiments are connected to this. But the reorientation of culture towards the Greek classical tradition is a restatement and a resurgence of, the ra of rationality, of the Greek logical, reasonable tradition. At the end of the Renaissance, there's a counterattack. There's a response to the new paganism that has been overtly incorporated into Catholicism and into particularly Southern Europe. And this Northern European counterattack is a reestablishment and reassertion of the emphasis on sentiment or feeling, and it's called the Reformation. What the Reformation does is cleanse house. It gets rid of all pagan non-scriptural elements and leaves us with a sort of emphasis on emotion that 
does not preclude the possibility of powerful intellectual work being done, but which emphasizes and is ultimately founded on the mythos. As Luther said, he who would be a Christian must tear out the eyes of his reason. Now, one of the unfortunate consequences of this is a period of warfare and conflict, which is a disgrace to all parties. And the response to that, the Greek response, the rational response, is called the Enlightenment. And what we see here is a revival of the Greek tradition of rationality. And what we see there is a re-emphasis on rationality, is a re-emphasis on reason, and a movement away from the mythos to the logos. God is no longer the center of discourse in the Enlightenment the way it was in the Reformation. The new center of intellectual life is now going to be nature. We move from God the Father to Mother Nature. The response to the Enlightenment comes about the beginning of the 19th century. It is a revival of sentiment, profound feeling, and this is called Romanticism. A great age for literature, if not for theology, although there are some theological works. And this, again, appeals to the other half of the human psyche. It appeals to our emotions. It appeals to our feelings. It appeals to our desire for a mythological orientation, a desire to get away from the sterility of mere reason. And the next phase after that, there's a revival of science, a revival of the Greek tradition, a revival of simple or at least direct rationality in the late half of the 19th century. We might call this the age of science. And once the age of science breaks down, and I think that conclusively is over by the time we begin the epoch of world war, we are now in another age of irrationality, an age of heroic sentiments, of profound feelings, of great emotions. So in other words, throughout the history of the West, there's been a dialectic between reason and emotion as perhaps there is within our own individual lives, within our own individual psyches. And this is not a question of either or, it is rather a question of degree. It is a question of how much emphasis will be placed on reason and emotion. The Christian or the, the biblical orientation, uh, the Reformation and Romanticism and the modern age, the 20th century age of the ego, are all ages which stress the limitations of rationality. The Greek tradition, the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, and the age of science in the late 19th century are the ages which stress discipline of the emotions, restriction of sentimentality, limitation on the non-certain or non-rational. It's not a question of either or, it's a question of degree. Both must be part of any living, vital intellectual tradition. Now, realism and idealism, and I'll close with this or at least this part of the, the section, with a consideration of that. We have a myth in the West, it's not a biblical myth, but it instantiates the idea very nicely of the tradition within the rational tradition of a conflict between the realists and the idealists, of a conflict between the metaphysicians and the naturalists, of a conflict between those who are skeptical and those who are dogmatic. And this myth encapsulates that in a beautiful and profound form. The myth I'm talking about is called Don Quixote, and all of the great rationalists, all of the great metaphysicians, all of the great dogmatic idealists are latter-day Don Quixotes, they're all knights errant, who are going to do some great and incalculably profound thing, and they never seem to entirely achieve it. On the other hand, the skeptical, naturalistic doubters those who are inclined to bring us back down to earth are instantiated in the mythological formulation of Sancho Panza. Think about the connection between the English intellectual tradition and the German intellectual tradition. We have a bunch of lofty and somewhat obscure and nebulous knights errant who are going to construct metaphysical systems that are going to answer all possible philosophical questions. It is a wonderful aspiration. It has never yet been done successfully. The whole intellectual tradition that comes out of England, comes out of Scotland with its this-worldly, secular, skeptical orientation, is like Sancho Panza telling Don Quixote that windmills are windmills. 
it is worth considering that while I think there is no doubt that windmills are windmills, Don Quixote cannot be entirely written off. If he is never successful, he still represents one of the greatest elements in the human psyche and one of the greatest elements of what we could potentially be. The great philosopher Santayana said when talking about Don Quixote that everyone laughs at Don Quixote's misadventures, but no one laughs at his intentions. In fact, when we think about his intentions, we cannot help but be impressed, and no matter how many times we're faced with failure throughout all aridity and all disenchantment, we cannot help but admire his aspirations, and it may be that Don Quixote is the one who keeps reminding Sancho Panza that hope is a virtue. That's something worth considering when we go back and read literature. Do not disdain literature. There is much wisdom there. Not all of what is worth knowing is contained within logic and reason.